when I was invited to join you today, I thought, what would I want to know if I were in the shoes of someone in the States and thinking about this clean power plan? So the clean power plan, for those of you who are not spending every minute of your time on this, <laughs> is a 1,700-page regulation that is affecting existing power plants in the United States. It will reduce greenhouse gas emissions from fossil units, uh, generating units around the country, and is one of the key components of the national commitments that the United States has put uh, into the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as part of our INDCs, the individual, I don't even remember the acronym, but it's something about each state, each country's commitments about what they think they can do to make progress on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's pretty important. Uh, some people say it doesn't go far enough, but it's, it's a big deal. Uh, and <laughs> one of some, a recent time when I really had a lot of fun on Capitol Hill defending this clean power plan, uh, I was asked, you know, this just isn't fair. Why are we doing this? Uh, it's not going to make a dent in the world. One out of every 15 tons of emission anywhere in the world from any source comes from U.S. power plants. So it's a big deal to make a dent in uh, the emissions from this sector. So with that, let's see if I can make this advance. No. I can't make it advance. Does someone know how to make it advance? Da, da, la. <coughs> so the, uh, oh good. Um, what I wanna do is sharpen the focus on the types of questions that I think states need to address over the next year, and then what comes after that. Awesome, okay. So for those of you who have not learned a lot about this, this may not be enough detail. For some of you spending all of your time on this issue, it's going to be too much detail. I don't know if I got the right mix here. <laughs> but this part of the Clean Air Act is one in which the federal government has a process of federal state cooperation. And this is one in which after the EPA issues its rule, the states then have to develop their own plans. Uh, this is not different than the state implementation plans that states have had to do for decades, for example, to get rid of smog. So states have been doing that kind of thing for a long time. But this is one of the first places in the power sector where this is the model uh, that's being used for addressing uh, emissions reductions. So I'm going to try to describe what options are available to the states. A year ago, the draft rule was presented, and it was really complicated, and states in some, in some instances were kind of deer in the headlight about, wow, we asked you for a lot of flexibility and you gave it to us, whoa, what do we do now? The Clean Air Act is, uh, a federal law that is typically implemented by the state air agencies in the states. The power plants in the states are typically regulated, if at all, by the states, by the Public Utility Commission. And the state air offices typically are thinking about smokestacks from power plants or the water withdrawals or water emissions from power plants. But this is a real different hybrid. And so state energy offices, state public utility commissions, and state air offices all really have something to bring to the table in thinking about a state plan. So does a state want to file a plan? What does that mean? I'll come back to that in a minute. Do you want to allow emission trading? We do have a sulfur dioxide trading program. Put your hands up if you've heard of that one. This is the acid rain program in which people traded the right to pollute for different approaches. So do you want to do that for carbon dioxide? Uh, I'm going to go through some of these just as we get there. The most, maybe the punchline is, what do you have to do in the next 11 months to really make a difference here? Okay. 
Does your state want to file a plan? What does that mean? Does your state want to file a plan? Don't we have to file a plan? Um, the Clean Air Act in this part of the uh, law says, if you can't stand doing this, this isn't the word, this is not, not the words the Clean Air Act says. <laughs> if you don't want to do this, that's fine. The federal government will be here to help you and will give you a federal implementation plan. So there are many states, many of your states maybe, I don't know, who really <laughs> don't like this plan. And uh, that's a, a, <laughs> a modest way of putting it. And some of them have already filed suit to um, enjoin it from going into effect. So those states actually, as well as other states, have a right to decide, I'm not doing a plan. And so there is a process in place that if a state doesn't want to do a plan, this is what happens. I'll come back to that. So the first choice a state has is, are we going to play ball or not? If you don't play ball, you get a federal implementation plan. So it's going to come at you. So yes or no? If you don't want to file a plan, you can simply just not submit paper to EPA, and you will be on track to get a federal implementation plan at some point. The time in which this plan goes into effect is 2022. And so between now and then, uh, you actually are seeing a, dr a draft rule about what will be coming. And the draft rule in this, in this FIP, or Federal Implementation Plan, is a rule that looks like the sulfur dioxide trading rule, kind of. It means if you are a power plant in those states, the, the power plants have the right to figure out for each other how they want to trade the right to emit carbon. And the, they would do that by either over-controlling or over-emitting their, uh, you know, their carbon relative to the national standards. And so there will be a national program that will evolve that will allow that kind of trading approach. So if you don't want to follow a plan, this will be the model. If you do want to do a plan, then what happens? Do you want to allow trading? So same kind of question is if you don't do a plan, the next question is, do you want to allow trading? Do you want to allow trading inside your state only? Or do you want to try trade? Does Florida want to trade with Minnesota? That sounds crazy. But carbon emissions don't really care about state borders. And they actually don't care about national borders. And a ton of emission reduced in North Carolina is equivalent to a ton of emissions reduced in California and so forth. So unlike some other air pollutants that have ground level effects, this is an area where it really does make sense to have trading in, in place as an opportunity to find the most efficient ways to reduce carbon. So if you want to do, don't want to do trading, then what happens? If you want to say, in my state, in the Sioux Tierney state, I want to put in place energy efficiency programs so that I don't have as much demand from the power plants and thereby reduce emissions, or I want a renewable portfolio standard and I want to have more power from renewable energy and lower carbon, I can do that in my state. I can piece together, if I want to do uh, a program to tighten up the voltage on the power lines, which will reduce how much power has to go into them to make them to make the, the juice flow more efficiently, you could do that. So there's gazillion things in the NASIO handbook that describe what you could do if you're going to do a state measures plan. A state measures plan is a jigsaw puzzle. You put together all the pieces and you say, EPA, this is what I'm doing. But if you wanted to do trading and allow lots of flexibility, you have other approaches involved. One approach is to think about, I'm going to use the words that are written here, a mass approach versus a rate approach. Uh, a mass approach for trading is imagining an entire bubble around this room, and the bubble reflects everybody in the, all the power plants in the footprint of the bubble. And the only thing that matters is at the end of some time period, 
the total amount of emissions from those power plants under that bubble can only meet X. And so what that typically means, as we have in the sulfur dioxide trading program, is that there's a certain amount of allowances to pollute. And those allowances are exactly equivalent to the amount of tons that can go up in the air. And you put them into the marketplace, and people bid for the right to buy them and get them. And those who bid the highest win. <laughs> and those who don't either have to tighten their belt or something else. I like to think of it as kind of like musical chairs. You have to figure out how to get in your chair or grab somebody else's chair in order to get there. We have a program like this working in the Northeast, uh, the regional greenhouse gas emissions. There is a cap on the amount of emissions. There is an auction every quarter. The power plant owners bid in to get an, an allowance, and then once they've got an allowance, they can either sell it to somebody else if they decide they don't need it, and some other party needs to have an allowance, or they buy more from somebody else. And so it, it is, in effect, a, a program where you can actually calculate exactly from the mass balance calculation of the fuel that's burned in a power plant, how much emissions were there. And the allowances have to, at the end of the day, the allowances turned in have to exactly equal the tons of emissions. Straightforward, it's very efficient. We've seen every one of these programs that has been in place like this is a cost-effective way to get pollution control. Now, a rate-based approach is something different, and we do have some models in air pollution where there are trading around a rate-based approach. What this means is everybody in the system has an allowable emissions rate. So the power plant over there gets to emit 1,000 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. And so everybody gets their targets, and I say, wow, I'm pretty cool. I only emit 800 pounds per megawatt hour. I got 200 here. And you over there, Marshall, you've got a power plant. You need 1,200 tons, I mean pounds, in order to do your megawatt hour. You might buy 200 from me. Or I might say, well, right now I'm 800, but if I tighten my belt, did some heat rate improvements, switched fuel, did something else, I could actually even go lower and make more available. So you can have this kind of trading regime available if you use this kind of approach. Those are entirely different methodologies for trading. EPA says that one state that develops a rate-based model, they can trade with any other state that also does a rate-based model. If you want to do a mass-based approach, it's kind of weird to do the trading. So mass-based caps can trade with people on caps. So there are those ways to go. Let's see. So then another important question is, what happens to new power plants that get permitted in the state? If you're, I don't know, Arizona or Alabama or something where you're growing pretty fast, uh, and you've got this cap on emissions, how are you going to free up emissions over time? So how are you going to handle new units? So new units will have to meet certain standards in order to actually get an air permit in the future. So that's the first tier. But then after that, EPA says you have a choice. If you're a mass-based approach, you have to include your emissions of new units in that, and you're all good to go. As long as you keep them in the system, it's airtight, it's, you're not going to be emitting, leaking emissions into somewhere else. But if you decide if you're a state, state of Sioux Tyranny, we're going to do a mass-based approach, but this new power plant comes in, I want to grow. I don't want him to, this guy to squeeze out all the other power plants in my system. So this guy has to, he's going to be out there on their own. EPA says, well, that's all nice and good. But you have to prove to us that when that new, say over here I've got 10 gas plants and they are emitting 1,000 pounds per megawatt hour each and we just got this new other power plant in. Let's say one of those power plants, let's, let me use this. this. One of the existing power plants emits 800 like the one I said I was a minute ago. 
and the new unit's coming in at 1,000, that guy, because he isn't in my program, when he is, uh, do, you notice how I call it a he? Isn't that nice? <laughs> I realize that was subliminal. I apologize. He, <laughs> when that guy is going to do his dispatch, he doesn't have to price in carbon in the same way that everybody else does in my system. Okay, in my cap and trade program over here, everybody had to buy an allowance, right? And that's part of the cost of producing power. So when those power plants are being dispatched, there's a carbon element of the cost. If this guy's not in my program, he's going to be dispatched ahead of an exactly the same power plant over here with exactly the same emissions who didn't have to buy allowances. And EPA says that's, that's going to be leaking carbon emissions from an equivalent existing unit into a new unit. So you have to figure out how that is going to be mitigated. You can't just increase your carbon emissions by building new power plants. That kind of defeats the purpose. Now, the reason I'm, this sounds pretty detailed, I'm sure, but my reason for going through this is I think there are really first and second and third tier questions that states need to address in the 1,700 pages of the rule. <laughs> and these are the questions. Do you want to do you want to file a state plan? Hell no. Okay. You get a cap and trading program. Okay, we're going to do a state plan. And if so, what's it going to look like? Is it going to be a plan with a lot of different pieces or are we going to set it up like the sulfur dioxide trading program? And each one that you go down, there are some pretty clear choices. It's not so clear when you read the rule. So I tried to decipher that, and this is what I came up with. Let's see if I can go through it really fast. So, <laughs> whoops, that's it. Okay, so that's your decision tree. And, but it's basically those ones I just said in the middle. Do you want to file a plan? Do you want to kind of control your destiny? If so, how complicated do you want to do it? How simply do you want to do it? And then do all the studies say the more expansive the number of power plants that are covered in a program across state borders, the more the lower cost this will be. So when I usually say that, somebody says, well, Sue, that state has a different target than that state. Because of the, the methodology EPA used is one that says, how many coal plants do you have? I'm gonna, this is really oversimplified. Really oversimplified. Each coal plant in your state has an emissions target that's the national emissions target for all coal plants. Then there is a national emissions target for all natural gas fired power plants. And there's hardly any oil plants anymore, so just ignore them anymore. <laughs> so the way a state got its target is how many gas plants do you have and how many coal plants do you have and multiply them times the targets. Now, it's more complicated than that, but that's essentially it. So a lot of states with a lot of coal have to reduce more than a neighboring state who has some natural gas plants or has a lot of renewables or something else. So you could have bordering states with really different targets because the targets are calculated by state boundaries. Electricity doesn't care about state boundaries. Certainly carbon doesn't. But governors do. <laughs> Did you remember that? And governors think, if we have to tighten our belt more, why would we want to trade with you? And so I'm here to encourage the proposition to say, let's look at the long-term health of the state <laughs> and recognize that, in fact, how many of your oil markets cross state boundaries, right? Put your hand up if your oil market in your state is a regional oil market. You better put your hands up, everybody. 
How many of your states, who's, anybody here from Texas? Okay. How many in your states, oh, Alaska, Hawaii, and Texas do not have to answer this question. How many of your states actually trade electricity with your neighboring states? Come on, everybody up. How many of you trade food across your state boundaries? Okay, let's just, okay, I, clothing, I could just do all sorts of other things. There's reasons why we have a national market for things, and in part it's because there are economies of scale, there are efficiencies, there's innovations, comparative advantages of this and that with a variety of people, and the more we think about this that way, and encourage our, our governors to calm down and that it would be a good idea to have trading for the long run, I would encourage your states to do that. Okay, EPA, when they did their flow chart, yeah, good luck, invite me into your talk to your governor. I have talked to governors before on this. I remember one time, let's see, what was it? When I was, I was secretary for the environment in Massachusetts, in another one of my jobs here, and I remember an economist, I was having lunch at Harvard with an economist. And the, I don't even remember the topic that I was talking about with them, but the question was whether Massachusetts was going to allow trading of something with out of state. And this economist was telling me, just like I'm telling you, well, it would be way more efficient if Governor Weld did this thing with Virginia because it would be socially a better thing. And I just looked at him and I said, but Governor Weld doesn't think that. <laughs> he would think, he would care about what's good for Massachusetts. So what's good for your states over time, I believe, even your states, is to find a, a, a larger than one state model. So EPA, when they did their, their flow chart, like the complicated one that I did, this is theirs. Now I want you to pay attention to some things. If I go over here, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, this is an animated slide. So I can do it right here. I forgot I animated this slide. So I wouldn't have to leave the microphone. So the top of this chart reads like my, net, my vertical stuff. So the top of this chart is a cap and trade, mass-based approach that's simple. The bottom of this chart is options that are way more complicated. So you can choose different branches of this chart, but I want you to notice some things. Okay, let's say you don't know whether to include new power plants in your program, whether you want them in or not. So. Side, start cranking your models so that you can prove to EPA that you will not be emitting more carbon at the end of the day by having it that way. Okay, so demonstrations and modeling. ICF and analysis group, we are going to have so much work, <laughs> right? <laughs> and here I am, I'm going against my own interests by telling you, okay, so that's more complicated. So if you want to do a program called a state measures program, you want to have an energy efficiency program, you want to have renewable portfolio standard, you want a water efficiency program, you want a transmission line, belt tightening, X, Y, Z. You have to demonstrate that adding up all of those pieces together is going to get you the carbon emissions reductions. This is a full employment act for <laughs> analysts. It's so cool. <laughs> so also, literally, if you want to do a rate-based approach with energy efficiency and XYZ, all of these things, you also have to set up a protocol for verifying that every, that your programs for energy efficiency are going to accomplish that, how you're going to verify it, monitor, et cetera, file that program afterwards, et cetera. But if you do a mass-based approach, you have one piece of paper to fill out. We are going to do this program. You set up, you opt in 
in essence to this program. You are able to trade with other states that are similarly situated. And the only verification you have to do at the end of the day is count the tons of emissions and compare them to the allowances at the end of the day. You've got a regime. So states can choose where they want to be on that map. But I'm encouraging all of you to go to your states to remember the options on the tree. There are some pathways that are administratively much easier and are shown to actually provide <laughs> lower cost compliance at the end of the day. Okay, so we've checked off. Do you want to file a plan? If you don't file a plan, you're going to get a trading program. If you want to do a plan with a trading program, that's the, that's the same result, basically. <clears throat> let's see. There's a couple of other questions. So the first one is, let's go to that one right now. What are the boundaries? OK, do you want your plan to follow the boundaries of electric systems? OK. They, you should not be fooled by the white color here. There are lots of different electric systems in that space. But for example, New York has one grid administrator called a balancing authority for the whole thing. New England has one system, and power flows in a integrated fashion. The mid-continent has a couple of balancing areas or grid, op grid sub-grid operators. Southern Company has its own grid here. Florida has its own, so there's all sorts of grid operators. Hardly any of them except the great state of ERCOT, <laughs> which is all within one state and therefore is not in interstate commerce. All the rest of them, except for Hawaii and Alaska, have interstate flows. So you notice these lines right here? <laughs> the dark blue lines. They couldn't care less about uh, electricity flows. Although, I mean, certainly every electric utility in the country that is inside one of those borders is either regulated by that state, of course, or is a muni or co-op electric company that is got a board of governors within that state. So there are a lot of things that matter about state lines. But power plant operations tend to be guided by interstate things. So the more that states are encouraged to find ways so that everybody in this area, all the power plants in that area have encouraged state governments in that area to say, join into that group. It sure makes more sense. So that this one grid operator, it has a common set of currency that they're dealing with for the power plant. Now, anybody here from Kentucky? You guys have white space, brown space, you've got purple space, so that's all in Kentucky. So, you have the power plants in each of those different areas. The Clean Air Act, I mean, the, the EPX rule allows you to essentially segregate the different power plants into plans that would look outward facing if that's what you chose to do. Same with Illinois. You see Illinois, you see most of the part of the state, excuse me, most of the part of the state physically, geog geographically, is in this big regional transmission organization. Most of the people in the state are in this one. So Illinois doesn't have to have the same approach for all of the power plants. They could, again, separate out. And right now, there's a lot of understandable inward looking by states about how each state's going to handle things. Uh, in the past year, there have been a lot of collaborative discussions across the state. For example, in the, in the upper Midwest, in the West, in the PJM states, about how they might go together. But there's now strong encouragement to have them really look at whether or not they want to adopt a similar, a similar approach. Now, this part of the country 
has this regional greenhouse gas initiative, nine states. And it's got, right now, it's got a cap over carbon, and it's operating <coughs> fine. And that was designed in a way in which the nine states wrote memorandums of understanding. I guess I could come back to this. So that I don't lose my voice. Um, those states adopted an MOU in which each state voluntarily adopted the same model rule and in so doing used their sovereign authority to come up with a centralized program. And the centralized program is one in which collectively they pool all their allowances, they auction them together, the Red G Inc. collects the money back and then sends it out to the states. So I'm calling that a centralized auction. The EPA approach doesn't require you to do it like that. There are, the, you could actually say, we want to have a multi-state approach, but we don't have to do an MOU. You could just adopt a, the, the, the kind of uh, standard program that they're, that they're making available, and in so doing, automatically line up with what other states are doing. So it's less cumbersome administratively. Um, some states might not choose the communist part of the country to follow. And there are ways to do it in a different way. The point is, we've been operating in a system in which electricity flows across state boundaries, and that's a good guidance for thinking about how to design this. So let's say I'm a state, I want to do trading, but I also want to keep my energy efficiency program. We've got great ones being operated by state energy offices. Look at every one of these programs. These are in, you know, we have building codes, appliance efficiency codes. We have all these things. I'm calling all of those complementary policies. They affect how much power gets produced by power plants, right? Each one of those things does. So if I wanted to do a state measures plan, I could decide to say my plan is made up of every one of those parts and turn it in, right? and say, I'm going to get this much from renewable portfolio standard and this much from energy efficiency. Remember, I told you, then you have to turn in the book about how you're going to do that. But let's say in Massachusetts, we have a cap and trade program, but we also have every one of those programs. And I don't need to tell EPA about those programs. I'm going to do energy efficiency because it's going to save customers on their electricity bills by managing their electricity use. It's actually going to help on the clean power plan because it's controlling demand for electricity. And so I'm just going to have that energy efficiency program. And I don't have to give it to EPA. It's just going to be there. And it's actually going to help because it keeps allowance prices down because you don't have so much, so much call on them from the power plants if they don't have to be producing as much electricity. So any state can do these, and they don't have to be part of a plan. They're just, like they are today, part of good policy. So my last slide, because I'm sure you're so sick of hearing about this, is what has to happen. So a couple of deadlines. By September 6th, 2016. Oh, I wrote that wrong. I'm sorry. The th First and third lines, say 2015. Those, that should be 2016. I'm sorry. My head was clogged up when I wrote that. Um, the first milestone that something has to happen is 2016, uh, basically a year, 11 months, 13 months after the EPA finalized its rule. Then power plants have to start controlling their emissions by 2022. So milestone, originally they had to do things by 2020, but they've got, states have two more years. So what does a state have to do by 2016, a year from now? Nothing. First choice is, again, remember, do I want to file a plan? And some states will choose not to. Some will do that on principle. They're suing the federal government to make this go away. Some states will feel like they can't get their act together. Some states just don't want to do it. They do not have to file a plan. If EPA does not get a document, a year from now, they will assume that state is on the track to get a federal implementation plan. So that's the first choice. The next one, if you're a state and you want to do a plan, what do you have to do by next year? 
You have to say, I'm either going to turn in my plan completely or I'm going to ask for two more years. Did you hear that? I either have to do it all done by one year from now or I'm going to have three years total to do my plan. So if you want to ask for two more years, this is what you do. You say, A, I'm looking at all of these things. Not, I've decided. I'm considering all of these things. B, I need more time. You could say our legislator doesn't meet. I could say we have a lot of things going on in our state. This is complicated. We're trying to figure it out. You need more time, right? And three, the third thing you have to say is how are we communicating with the public about what's going on? Three things. I need more time. This is what I'm looking at. You could, act, you could send in my, my, my thing and say, this is what I'm looking at. It's a lot to look at. Um, you could send in that flow chart, right? And that would say, that says enough. So EPA invites any state that wants to, to really have three times to, to prepare their plan. And then if EPA doesn't give it an answer back after, by November 6th, 2016, a state automatically gets the two more years. So in essence, every state has three years to figure out what it wants to do here to reduce emissions from carbon, if it wants to do a plan at all. And my main purpose in saying this is that there's, uh, over the last year, there's been a lot of overwhelmed thoughts about oh, this is a lot going on, you know, the state air agencies don't understand about markets or regulating power plants, the public utility commissions don't understand about the Clean Air Act, what are we going to do? There are all these differences and how are we going to do this? So there's a lot of time, but I think at the end of the day, there are some pretty straightforward questions to be answered. And then, of course, there's really important analyses that people have to do so that ICF can get more business. No. <laughs> and thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate it. I, w I will put another plug in for NASIO because uh, NASIO NARUC, our buddies at NARUC, the Regulatory Assistance Project, um, DOE, there's a lot of information out there about options and approaches. There are not that many flowcharts. So if you want a flowchart, I'll give you mine. How's that? Are there any questions, comments, tomatoes? Yeah. What role do you see the state legislature having in the decision making process? Because you're talking about the process. Could be a lot and might not have to be much, depending upon where, what option you choose. So let's see how fast I'll get up here. So I'm going back up here. So, na 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 na. Okay. So, um, so, no state plan, no state legislative action doesn't have to happen, and there'll be a federal implementation plan. If you decide you want to do a state measures program, and your state, for example, and you decide, well, renewables don't have carbon emissions and we'd like to encourage renewables energy here, then a state might choose to do a new law encouraging renewable resource development. A state that already has that kind of is starting with that as a, as a piece of their toolkit. And I think, maybe somebody knows this, I think about two-thirds of the states have a renewable program with an increasing amount of renewables that is required in that state. And EPA took that into account when they did their plan, how, how much renewables will be coming in, folding in. So I'm using that as an example of some tools that some states might want to do, um, energy efficiency programs or other things a state might need to, to do and act. Now, there may be some states where I, where my ignorance about their organic authorizing legislation, either for the air office or the public utility commission or something else, doesn't equip them with 
the same tools that some other states have. There might be some useful tools that w would be enacted. Um, there are the states that adopted Reggie, I'll use that as an example, varied. Some of the states, uh, Massachusetts is an example, they adopted authorizing language that established the state's ability to, to do this memorandum of understanding and then carry out, participate in Reggie. New York, that public service committee, who, anybody here from New York? That public service commission can just do whatever it wants. They restructured the electric industry. They adopted Reggie. The legislature didn't have to do anything. So those are two examples of something where there's just inherently different root authority. Um, but there, there are probably, a, probably more states will have to do something on the legislature. And one of the reasons why EPA said that they wanted to encourage more time is that they to allow the possibility for state legislators, ex especially because some don't meet except every other year. Uh, I guess that kind of answers it. Yeah, indirectly. Yeah. Is there anything to stop the? Um, is there anything to stop moving power plants across the border, so that say like you know MISO has they gets a lot of flow from Manitoba. Yeah. WEC gets it from uh, British Columbia. It also gets it from Mexico. Is there anything to say that you just can't move your power plants north and south, and then you know, so basically you're defeating the plan, but you're, you know, I mean, you're reading the rule of the law. I think what I'm about to say is true. So subject to check. You cannot trade out of the country in order to comply. So you could shut down a plant in North Dakota and build it across the border and comply. OK? That would be stupid. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> We just heard about that. And so if they have oil, you know, maybe this is one way they could burn it. Yeah, that, that could happen. Yeah, that could happen. Yeah. Is there banking for early reductions? The question was whether there's banking for early reductions. Uh, only limited. So EPA has set up what's it called, the something incentive? Clean energy incentive. Clean energy incentive plan. plan? program, P, P. For two years between 2020 through 2021, uh, st states can uh, elect to do extra steps and early in, uh, in the way of energy efficiency and renewables and thereby get some credit for doing that that then could be banked and used later on. But for the most part, no, and there's a, been a lot of criticism of EPA by states who say, those states who say, wow, I really have cleaned up my power sector already, <clears throat> so how come I don't get credit for that? And the way this works is the EPA looked at one year benchmark 2020-12. Did I say that right? 2012. Okay. Uh, and the emissions were as what they were in that year. And then your reductions are compared to that baseline year in 2022. So those in 2012 who've already done a lot says, why don't I get the credit whereas other people are cleaning up their act? Well, everybody else has to clean up more basically because they have more fossil generation as a result of some of those early steps as the way it's worked out. And I think that people can get a leg up on their trajectories for emissions reductions before 2022 without kind of doing cold turkey in 2022, but people don't get credit for it. Yeah. Anybody else? Go talk about oil. Thank you so much for your attention, everybody. Thank you, Dave. <laughs>